Hello everybody, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and today we are going to discuss about the application of the PCR. So, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the different aspect related to PCR like how to set up the PCR, what is the basic principle of the PCR and then uh, in the previous lecture we have also discussed about how to design the primers and how you can be uh, take the precautions and the uh, consideration before you can be able to finalize a primer sequence which you can use for amplifications. So, with this technical uh, background now we would like to uh, go ahead and would like to discuss about how you can be exploit the PCR as a technique to answer some of the questions and as well as how you can be able to utilize the PCR for the uh, understanding many aspects related to uh, science. So, mainly the PCR, the application of the PCR lies into the three different categories, either it could be related to molecular identifications or it could be used for the sequencing reactions or it could be used in the case of genetic engineering which means it the genetic engineering means it can be used even for the research purpose. So, regarding the molecular identifications, uh, the molecular identification means that you are trying to identify a particular organisms or if you are trying to identify and classify, suppose you have isolated a new organisms, then you how you can be able to uh, you know categorize that particular organism. So, see the, uh, in the traditional world what people are doing is suppose they have identified a new plant, they will take this plant to a experienced uh, taxonomist and that taxonomist is actually going to based on the experience and uh, based on the similarity of some of the taxonomical features, he would actually go and be able to classify that particular plant as uh, X and Y. But in the recent world, what people are more trying to understand is that what is the pattern of the these uh, DNA and whether can be we can be able to classify the plants and categorize them based on the DNA as well as the amplification products. So, in that way the molecular identification is uh, playing in uh, is a place where the PCR is actually playing a crucial role. So, molecular identification playing a role in the molecular archaeology, molecular epidemiology, ecology, DNA fingerprinting and it is uh, been used for the classification of organism because the uh, you can uh, be able to amplify the DNA and then you can be able to match that DNA with the DNA what is available in the database and that actually is going to help you in very precisely categorizing a particular plant or animal or even other creatures. Then you can use the, uh, the, the PCR for the genotyping, prenatal diagnostics, mutation screenings. So, the mutation screening is also a place where the you can be able to do a PCR and uh, it is actually going to tell you whether the particular type of mutation is been persisting into this particular gene or not and that has a very wide application in terms of the diagnostics because some of the mutations like for example, if there is a mutation and that mutation is uh, uh, linked to a particular type of disease phenotype, then you can be able to design a PCR and you can be able to design the primers in such a way that it is actually going to detect or it is only going to give you the amplified product when there will be a mutation. Other than that, if there will be no mutation then it will not give you the amplified products. So, that is how you can be able to identify the, uh, uh, the mutations in a certain set of genes and that is how you can be able to identify whether a particular, uh, uh, any particular cell is having the uh, mutated version of that particular gene or not. Uh, then you can also use the uh, uh, the the, uh, the PCR for the drug discovery as well as the genetic matching and the detections of the pathogens. So, detection of pathogen is also very very important area where you can be able to use the PCR because one of the one of the major advantage of the PCR is that it is very very sensitive. So, even if you have a very small uh, number of copies available uh, within the uh, particular organisms or within the blood, you can be able to even do a amplification, you can increase that number and you can be able to do uh, identification purposes.
Now the second is the sequencing. So in the sequencing reactions, uh, you can be able to use the PCR. So in a typical sequencing reactions, what you are doing is you are simply taking a DNA what you are interested to uh, sequence and then you are doing a PCR with the help of the primers and that uh, is actually going to give you uh, amplified DNA and that amplified DNA is being amplified in such a way that it is actually going to give you the DNA fragments. For example, if you talk about the Sanger's method, the DNA is being amplified with the help of the primers as well as the modified nucleotides and these modified nucleotides are actually going to give you the small, 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 small fragments and that small fragments can be used to uh, identify the sequence and that is how you can be able to get deduce the signal, uh, uh, deduce the sequence. Once you got the sequence, uh, you can be able to use uh, that sequence and matches with the database and that is how you can be able to do that in the bioinformatics. Uh, similarly, the PCR is being used for genomic cloning as well as in the human genome projects for uh, sequencing the uh, multiple transcripts or multiple uh, DNA fragments what is being produced from the DNA libraries. Apart from that in the genetic engineering or the research purposes the PCR is being widely being used for uh, two purposes one is that they are being used for generating the site directed mutagenesis which means you can be able to very precisely generate a point mutation into a particular gene and that is how you can be able to answer the questions like for example if there is an enzyme which is actually having an aspartate and that aspartate is very crucial so then you what you can do is is with the help of the PCR you can be able to do in, in introduce a mutation and that will be a point mutations and that point mutation will replace the aspartate to alanine or glycine or as per your hypothesis and as per the interaction of that aspartate with the neighboring residues and that is how you can be able to answer the questions that whether that particular aspartate is crucial for a particular activity or not. The other is that a gene expression study, so with the help of the PCR uh, you can be able to even study the expression of that particular gene. So uh, considering all these three different uh, aspects, we have uh, taken the full, ex uh, we, we are now going to get into the application part and we are going to take up the application as per the different uh, streams of the science, for example the plant science, animal science and also. So let us start with that. So the first what we have done is we have taken the example of the PCR how you can be able to use the PCR in the food science. So when, it, when you talk about the food science, the food science is all about that you are talking about the vegetables as well as the fruits. So you, as you can see in this picture we have the different types of the fruits and the vegetables. The major problem with these fruits and vegetables what you can buy in the market or what has been produced in the form is that they are infected with the different types of pathogenic organisms. And if you consume that these pathogenic uh, uh, vegetables or the fruits, the particular uh, bacteria or viruses are actually going to get into the human body and that is how these uh, uh, fruits and vegetables are not good for the consumptions. So how you will know that the particular lot of fruit or the vegetable is good for the human consumptions. So in that case what you are going to do is you are going to do the PCR and in the so suppose I am interested to identify the salmola. So salmola is a very very uh, uh, dangerous bacteria and it actually causes a lot of disease in the humans. So if you consume a vegetable which is infected with the salmola then it is actually going to cause the uh, toxicity. So what you are going to do is if you are suspecting a salmola infection what you can do is you take the vegetables okay and then what you can do is you can just isolate the uh, cells. So you can just crush these uh, vegetables, you can just make a homogenate and then from this homogenate you can be able to just do a PCR with the help of the primers. These primers are nothing but these primers are actually going to be for salmola. So in that case what will happen is if there will be even a tiny salmola contaminations, even if there will be a few salmola bacteria what is present in this particular plant 
or in this particular vegetables, it is actually going to give you a amplified DNA. So let us see besi besides the salmola, what are the other things you can be able to detect in the, which are related to the food microbiology. So one first is the salmola. So salmola is being detected with the help of a target gene which is called as NVA. And what you can do is that you can do a qPCR as well as the TACMAN. Then you have uh, several species of salmola. So the, the, the advantage of the PCR is that it allows you to not only detect the particular type of bacteria, but it also allows you a particular species of bacteria. So there are, uh, so, so you can actually first identify the salmola and then you can be able to use a set, another set of primers and that actually will allow you to detect what species of the uh, salmola is in be present with the uh, vegetable or the food materials. Apart from that, you, it is also going to allow you to uh, detect this uh, Listeria or Staphylococcus aureus or Enterobacteria, E. coli, uh, Bacillus and the total vi uh, viable bacteria. So that is also can be done that you can actually simply go whether the, there will be a bacterial infection uh, into the vegetable or food or not. Uh, and then there are other uh, options as well. Then you are talking about the PCR in the medical science. So the use of PCR in the case of medical science is very, very extensive and in fact, when the people have designed the PCR technology, they designed the te PCR technology because of the medical science only. So in the, in the, in the early 80s, when the people were trying to amplify the, some of the crucial genes, what is being responsible for sickle cell anemia and other kind of diseases, they were having a very, very difficult task. So that's why they have decided that, okay, let's have a technique so that it will actually going to allow us to amplifications and that's how the PCR is being used. So, so the use of PCR in a medical science already started in the year of 1985 and a viable test for measuring the amount of HIV in the blood and that was published in May 1987. So in the 1989, the Nor Aryan and the team developed a multiplex PCR and the amplification of single cell was performed for the first time on the single sperm cell to directly analyze the product of the meiotic recombination and was also applied on the other targets like the human leukocyte antigen that the DQ alpha. So PCR technology has become an essential research and the diagnostic tools for improving the human health and the quality of life. It allows the detection of the infectious organism just from one cell by the amplification of the specific region of the genetic material. So one of the major advantage as I said before also that the sensitivity of the, this method. So this because the sensitivity is very high, you can actually be able to detect the infectious organism or the alteration within the host gene itself from a single cell. So the amount of DNA what you are going to receive even from the single cell or amount of genome what you are going to receive even from the single cell that is good enough to give you the enough products which can be analyzed both for sequencing purposes as well as if you want to clone that you can be able to clone it into a expression vector you can study lot of things. So that is why the PCR is being widely being used in the case of medical science as well. Uh, so PCR is being used very extensively for detecting the infectious disease. So PCR technology has become the basis for a broad spectrum of clinical diagnostic tests for various infectious disease including viruses and bacteria. Unlike the traditional antibody based diagnostic tool that depends on the patient to develop the antibody over time, PCR allows the faster diagnostics which fasten the treatment and recovery. Besides detecting the presence of pathogens, the PCR allow us to quantify the amount of pres present in the blood and it helps to monitor the progression of infection or response to the treatment. So what are the disease you can be able to detect? Uh, so this is just not the extensive list, we, this is just a representative list. What you can, can detect? You can detect the HIV which causes the AIDS. Then you can detect the hepatitis B and C virus which causes the liver disease and the cancer. Then you can detect the human papilloma virus which can lead to the cervical cancer. You can detect the chlamydotrachomodus which causes the infertility in women. You can detect the Neisseria uh, which causes the pelvic inflammatory disease in women. And then you can detect the cytomegalovirus which actually detects 
uh, the uh, transplant patient and the immunocompromised people such as AIDS patients. And then lastly, you can also detect the mycobacterium tuberculosis which causes the tuberculosis in the patients. In, a, in general, when you are looking for the detection of these pathogenic organisms, traditionally what people were doing, we were, they were just simply using the antibody. So, what happen is when these infectious organisms are entering into the body, they are actually being act as an antigen. So, when the antigen is entering into the body, it is actually causing the development of antibody. But in this period, when the antigen is entering into the human body and it is developing the antibodies, it is a very, very, very long period, which means it will take at least 14 to 21 days before you could be able to detect some amount of antibody and then you can be able to say, okay, this particular infectious organism is present. But that actually requires a very large amplification or the large multiplication of the first the infectious organisms, then only the body's immune system is going to recognize that and then it is actually going to process that antigen and it is actually going to give you the antibodies. So, this is a very, very delay response and what happens since we, until the PCR was not been developed, the people were using this particular technique. But the major disadvantage of the antibody based uh, test is that it actually going to you know, before you can be able to detect, it, it, act, the, it will allow the disease to reach to a very, very uh, serious st stage, which means the, it, will, it is actually by, by the time you will detect the uh, disease in the particular human being or particular patient, the disease is going to be reached to a, such a level that it is actually non-treatable or it is difficult to treat. So, that is why the people have moved to the uh, PCR based method because in the PCR method what you have to do is uh, depending on the site of the infection. For example, if it is a liver or uh, you know sputum or blood, uh, you know you have to draw that particular type of uh, uh, human tissue and then you have to just simply uh, you know make a homogenate and then you have to take a small uh, you know few microliter of that particular sample and that actually is good enough with the help of the PCR which is going to be specific for these infectious organisms which means like you, you are going to have a set of primers which are actually going to detect the HIV or the you are going to have a set of primer which is actually going to be directed of the sum of the classical proteins what is present in the mycobacterium tuberculosis and that is good enough to detect the mycobacterium tuberculosis because it is at the end you are going to see a band which is going to be specific for the mycobacterium tuberculosis. And that is how with the help of the PCR people have cut down the detection process. So, that that is how the, uh, the detection is going to be much faster compared to the antibody based method. So, in a, in a typical PCR infectious disease method, for example, this is a classical example of HIV. So, what we are showing is that what you have to do is you have to just draw uh, 5 to 10 ml of blood and then from the blood what you are going to get is what you have to do is you have to burst you have to isolate the leukocytes and from the leukocytes you can be able to sim directly perform the PCR reactions with the help of the primers what is being directed against the HIV. So, uh, you can use uh, some of the basal metabolic uh, pathway uh, in enzymes what is present in the HIV like either the RNA polymerase or some of the code proteins and that actually is going to allow you to amplifications. So, when you run it into the PCR machine and then if you analyze that result into the PCR gel, what you are going to see is that we are running the two samples, the so sample 1 and sample 2 and the sample 1 is going to give you a amplified DNA which is corresponding to the size of the DNA what is being reported for at that particular gene in the from the HIV viruses. Whereas, the sample 2 does not giving you that particular amplified product, which means the sample 2 is negative for HIV, whereas the sample 1 is positive for HIV, which means that this sample 2, the patient of sample 2 
is positive for that particular disease. So, this is just an example and the schematic diagram to show that what is the protocol you have to follow. For example, in the case of mycobacterium tuberculosis, it is even going to be very, very simple because then you, what you have to do is you have to simply collect the sputum of that particular patient and the, from the sputum you can be able to just recover the bacteria or you can just simply use the sputum as such and then you can just perform the PCR with the help of the primers and that is good enough to give you the amplified product if the some amount of bacteria is present. So, even few, few cells of the bacteria is actually good enough to give you a amplified product. Uh, so, PCR is also being used in the blood screening. So, the PCR technology helps in detecting the presence of infectious disease in the donated blood samples. Uh, benefit of using the PCR technology is to monitor uh, include a decrease in the waiting period during which the infection is undetectable by the serological screening technology that relies on the formation of the antibodies. Uh, the ability to perform combined blood screening for common life threatening pathogen like the hepatitis, hepatitis C and HIV. Combination of the PCR based test incorporate into the blood drawing screen could increase the awareness and reduce the contamination of the virus transmissions. So, what happen is when you are actually going to give the blood for donations the blood could have the potentially could have the infectious organisms. For example, you could so the, the donor could be infected with the HIV or donor could be infected with the hepatitis. So, there are set of infectious organisms which are already being listed that before you you know before you uh, you know collect the blood from a donor and before you give this blood to a acceptor you have to perform the detection of the infectious organism. So, in that you have to perform the test for the HIV, you have to perform the test for the hepatitis and all that because these are the organism which actually can transmit from one person to another person if you do not detect that. So, the PCR is very, very advantageous because you can just simply take a small uh, you know few microliter of the blood and then you can be able to do a PCR and it is actually going to allow you to, uh, to detect the HIV as well as the hepatitis and all other kinds of infectious organisms. The other advantage is that compared to the other technique like serological techniques, you might have to perform the different serological reactions like different reactions for detecting the HIV, different reactions for detecting the, uh, the hepatitis and different re reactions for detecting the mycobacterium tuberculosis. Whereas, in the case of PCR, you can be able to mix all the primers together and you can be able to detect all these infectious organisms in, in a single goal considering that the size of the DNA as well as the similarity of the sequences may not exist. So, you can be able to do a single step uh, detection of all the infectious organism what is present in the blood of a donor and that is how you can be able to very safely uh, you know get the blood uh, from the donate donor person and you can be able to use that uh, blood with a lot of uh, assurance that it will not going to transmit any kind of uh, disease to the acceptors. Then the PCR can be used in the plant science. So, there are various uh, fields or aspects in which the, of the plant science in which you can use the PCR for uh, PCR technology. One of the major is that you can be able to use the PCR for the plant species identifications. So, the PCR technique has also been employed in the identification of the plant species using the species and the group specific primers targeting the chloroplast DNA. Remember that we are talking about the chloroplast DNA not the genomic DNA because the chloroplast DNA is something what continued from the family to family because in, as far as the plant is concerned. So, genomic DNA is keep altering uh, with every recombination because you know that if the plant is having a male and female, the male had its own genome, the female had its own genome and during the recombination when they are actually going to form the pollen grain as well as the, uh, the ovaries the genome is actually going to go through with the process of meiosis and that is how it is going to be split. So, for example, if you have two, two pairs of uh, uh, LEs, then for example, AA and BB, 
it is actually going to split. So it is going to split into AA and AA like this. So, so if you go with the genomic DNA uh, things, you are actually going to see that there will be a contamination. Whereas if you go with the chloroplast DNA, it is going to be remain constant because the chloroplast in the plant system also the chloroplast comes from the female side. So that actually continued over the multiple family, multiple uh, generations and it does not get affected if whether the uh, things are coming from the male side or things are coming from the female side. These assays allow the identification of plant based on the size specific amplicons. For example, the plants belonging to the same family has a close primer binding site and hence they are going to give you the same size of amplicons. So this is for example, all these S12, S10 are actually belonging to the same family and what you see is that the primers are in the genome or in the, in the chloroplast DNA, the primers are binding to a same location and that is how the resultant amplicons are going to be of same size because it is actually going to give you a ampli amplified DNA of this size irrespective. So, all the S1, S2, S3 and all that S10 are actually belonging to a same family. But if you are expecting that they are not going to belong to the same family, what will happen is that primers are going to bind to the multiple different places. So, as, it, as you can see from the S11 to S20, all these plants are belonging to different families and since you are using the primers only for the families, what you see is this primer is binding here and this primer is binding here. This means this is the amplified product what you are going to get. Whereas for the S12, this primer is binding here and this primer is binding here, which means this is the amplified product what you are going to get. So, if the um, primers will bind to a different location, it is actually going to give you the different signs of amplicons and that is how it is actually going to indicate that these plants species or these plants are belonging to different families because every family is going to have a signature sequence which you are probing with the help of these primers. But if they are belonging to a different families, the, the location of these primers are going to be different because that is how the diversity is being present in different families. So, if the plant belonging to a different species and grow uh, groups have been different primer binding site, hence it will result in a different amplicon size. Apart from that, you can be able to also study the plant microbe interactions. So, the RT-PCR technique which is a derived technique from the PCR due to its uh, sensitivity has also been used in the detection of microbes infesting a crop plant. Early diagnosis of the pathogens is essential to provide rapid and suitable measurements for limiting the epidemics and the selection of the appropriate control measures. So, these are the few list what we are uh, we, which can which can be used. For example, in the case of the Claviobacter spentacle which actually causes the which actually affects the uh, potato tubers, then you have Relstonia uh, which actually causes the effect in the potato tubers, then you have the agrobacterium strains which actually affects the different types of plants and the mechanism remains the same that when you are you know detecting the these uh, when you are interested to detect these uh, infectious organisms or the microbes what you have to do is you have to just take the plant that part for example you can simply take a plant leaf and you can just you know crush this leaf and you can be able to isolate the dna and then what you can do is you can just do a pcr with the help of the primers which are belonging to this particular infectious organisms and that is how it is actually going to give you. If it is going to give you an amplified product which means that particular infectious organism is associated with the leaves. So, depending on the site of infestations and depending of the site of infections, you can be able to isolate that particular plant part. For example, in some cases it may not be leaf, it could be stem or the root. So, that particular organ of the plant has to be isolated and then from that organ you can just simply isolate the DNA and then you can just perform the PCR or the RT-PCR. 
uh, PCR can be used even in the tissue culture because you know the, in the tissue culture when you are starting with a uh, it, with a single cell or with it, with it, with a small uh, plant part and then eventually you are generating a differentiated uh, mass of cell which is called as the callus and then from the callus you are actually putting the differentiating hormones. So, you are actually generating the callus to shoot and the root. So, all these events are associated with the upper regulation and the down regulation of the different types of genes and that uh, expression as well as the pattern can be also studied with the help of the PCR and that is how you can be able to study with the help of the PCR at what stage your plant is present because how you will know that the plant has formed the callus or the plant has formed the shoots and roots. So, all these events can be even categorized or characterized with the help of the PCR as well. So, the use of PCR in tissue culture was already reported in the case of 1992. It was used in the analysis of DNA and the specific genes in the plant cell at a different stage of the regeneration during in vitro culture along with the RAPD technology. The level of the polymorphism in the regenerated plant could be revealed by these dual techniques. PCR could flawlessly amplify neomycin phosphotransferase gene and antibiotics which is used as a selection marker in the transgenic plant. So, apart from the looking at the different stages, you can also be able to see whether the plant is been uh, you know is, is a plant has whether plant has taken up the uh, foreign gene and it is been integrated into the genome or not whether the plant has been converted into a transgenic species or not and whether the transgenic species is stable or unstable because once you remove the selection pressure whether it remains the genes remains within the plant or not or whether it get excluded from the plant. So, that all that kind of questions can be asked simply by using the PCR because in most of the transgenic species you are going to use some of the marker enzymes as a selection pressure. So, those genes for those selection pressure can be used to detect whether that particular gene is associated with the plants or not. And Apart from that, the PCR is also being used in the veterinary parasitology. So, in the veterinary parasitology, you can be able to detect the, for example, this particular uh, disease virus in the pig. So, this virus causes the abortion and the mortality in piglets. This disease has a latent period where there is no symptom of infection, making it difficult to eradicate the disease completely. For this reason, the PCR is considered to be the appropriate tool for detecting the latent case of this disease and the PCR assay was developed in the case of 1989. Then you have the bo bo uh, bovine leukemia virus. This virus causes the zoonotic bo bovine leukosis. The PCR assay for detection of the BLV was developed in the case in the year of 1991. And then you have the bovine viral di diarrhea virus. So, this virus is not only fatal to the cattle but also causes contamination in calf serum used in the cell culture work thus leading to the contamination of vaccines and the pharmaceutical products. So, besides the above examples, the PCR has been used routinely in the diagnosis of the veterinary viruses such as the porcine parvo, uh, bovine papilloma type 1 and type 2, uh, avion polymer, chicken anemia, duck hepatitis and so on like the swine flu viruses and all that kind of thing. So, PCR can be used even to detect some of the infectious organism what is been affecting the veterinary uh, or animals and the ducks and all that kind of thing. Uh, PCR can be used in the forensic science. So, in the forensic science the PCR is being used in two aspects. One is the criminal investigations. So, in the criminal investigations what you are going to do is the, each individual has a different set of DNA profile known as the DNA fingerprinting. A DNA Fingerprinting uses variable number of tandem repeat which is called as the VTNR loci as these loci is so vulnerable that the unrelated individuals are unlikely to have the same VTNR. A sample of blood, hair, root or tissue left in the crime scene can be used to identify a person using PCR by comparing the DNA of the 
क्राइम सीन विद दैट ऑफ द सस्पेक्ट और विद द डी एन ए डेटा बेस ऑफ द अर्लियर कन्विक्ट एविडेंस फ्रॉम द डिकेड ओल्ड क्राइम कैन बी टेस्टेड कन्फर्मिंग और डिपेंडिंग ऑन द पीपल ओरिजिनली कन्विक्टेड सो इन द पी सी आर पी सी आर कैन बी यूज इवन इन द फॉरेंसिक साइज इन टू आस्पेक्ट्स वन आस्पेक्ट इज इट कैन बी यूज फॉर अ क्रिमिनल इन्वेस्टिगेशन सो यू नो दैट एवरी ह्यूमन बींग हैज इट्स पर्टिकुलर सेट ऑफ डी एन ए रिपीट्स and these repeats are peculiar to that particular person and it cannot be matched with the next person so that can be used and can be explored with the help of the pcr so if you use the primers to detect or to amplify these uh, marker sequences it is actually going to give you the whether the that particular suspect is a criminal or not because what you are going to do is you are going to isolate the tissue you can be able to isolate the blood or you can be able to isolate the hair and all that kind of biological samples from the crime scene and then you can be able to detect the dna and then you can just simply do a pcr and once you do the pcr it is actually going to give you the particular pattern of the dna and then you can do a simple pcr for the suspected person like 1 and 2 and all that and then you do the exactly the same that you are going to run all these on a uh, agarose gel and what you can see in this case is that all these suspects you what you have to do is you have to do a image analysis and then you have to do a side by side comparison so this band is present here but it is absent here so this suspect 1 is innocent actually so then suspect 2 suspect 2 is having this band so this band is present but it is not having the band number 2 so the band number 2 is absent whereas the band number some of the other bands are also very very you know this band is also not present so this guy is also innocent this guy first guy is also innocent and the third guy is actually having the similar pattern of the dna what it is been present from the dna what is been isolated from the crime side so that's why the suspect number 3 is actually a convict person it may be having a role in that particular type of crime and you can suspect or you can actually uh, do some more background studies and you can be able to do some more additional evidences and you can collect some more evidences to confirm whether this person is involved in that particular crime or not but what surely this analysis is going to say that the this person was present at the site of the crime similarly for the suspect number 4 also some of the dna patterns are not matching so this guy is also a is a innocent guy he was not present at the site of the action apart from that if you also want to do what people also do or what the police is also doing is it is actually having this kind of pattern of all these people like the criminal people what they are doing is they are generating a database of these criminal peoples they are generating a dna library and that's how once they got a dna and once they got a pattern what they can do is simply take this pattern and blast it into their database and then it will say okay it is matching with these four people okay and that's how it is actually going to say that these are the potential criminals possibly involved in this particular type of action and that's how they can be able to pinpointly uh, uh, you know catch those guys and do the further investigations the second aspect where the uh, pcr is been used in the forensic science is the parental testing so in the parental testing what happen is the sometime when the kids are been kidnapped or kids are been you know there will be a mismatch of the kids even in the hospital as well then there will be always a question of who are going to be the parents of this particular kid so in those kinds of parental disputes the people are also going with the dna based assays so mostly what they are doing is they are simply going with the pcr and then matching the pcr results with the parents like the mother and father as well as the other persons and so the pcr technology is also been used in the finding the biological parents of a adopted or the kidnapped child where the dna of a child is matched with the close relatives the actual biological father of a newborn can also be ruled out in parental testing the short tandem repeats or the strs 
are used as a marker where each person's DNA copies contain two copies of these markers and one each from the father as well as the mother. These markers differ in length and sometime in the sequence as well. So, uh, what you can see is that you have the different types of DNA markers like A, B, C, D and E and all these markers are present in the mother as well as in the father but a combination is going to be present into the child. For example, in this case what you see is for the DNA marker A, the 26 is present from the mother and 30 is present from the father which means the child is going to be a hybrid of the father and mother. So, that is why it will although mother is having 26 and 31, the father is having 29 and 30, uh, the, the children is going to have the 26 and 30. So, same is so this kind of analysis is going to allow to identify the father. So, imagine that you have the multiple candidates who are claiming that they, do, they could be a father of this particular child. So, then what you can do is you can simply do a uh, analysis of the multiple candidates with the help of the different types of DNA markers and then you can check whether that is matching or with the child or not. So, another sensitive technique that can be used to establish the maternal relationship between people is called as the mitochondrial DNA analysis which relies on the PCR. This analysis is better than the fingerprinting for sample which becomes too old that the nucleus of the cells get degraded. So, apart from these people are also using the mitochondrial DNA because as I said in the past also the mitochondrial DNA is something which remain conserved throughout the family. So, if and you know why because the mitochondrial DNA is what people are having whether it is a male or the female is always coming from the mother side rather than a father side. So, if you analyze the mitochondrial DNA which is not going to be diluted because all the genomic DNA is going to be diluted in every uh, offspring like every after every generation you are going to have the half from your father and half from your mother and but the mitochondrial DNA is going to be remain intact. So, if you follow the mitochondrial DNA very precisely you can be able to uh, collect the the pedigree of that particular family and you can be able to even identify the father as well as the mothers. Then the PCR is also being used very successfully in the case of the research applications. So, PCR is being used in the case of DNA cloning. So, uh, PCR is being used in the DNA sequencing, then you also being used in the sequence based sites it is also being used in the phylogenetic analysis and it is also being used in the gene expression studies. So, in the case of DNA cloning, the PCR helps to amplify the specific DNA from a genome and the amplified DNA can be inserted into a vector for transformation and the expression. These inserts can further be confirmed by the PCR methods. Then the DNA sequencing, the PCR assists the task of DNA sequencing from the patient with the genetic disease mutations. Then the sequence tag sites, this is a process where the PCR is used and an indicator if a particular segment of a gene or genome is present in a particular clone. This application is vital in mapping the cosmic clones to be sequenced by the human genome projects. Then it is also being used in the phylogeny analysis. So, the phylogeny of organisms like the plant, animals and other lower organisms can be traced out by the DNA analysis. The origin of unknown sample like the recovered bone of early man can also be ruled out. The DNA of different organism can also be distinguished. For example, in the case of mammals, the conserved regions such as the 3 prime UTR of the sun gene can be used to identify the mammalian origin of a sample. Using this test, the DNA of the human, monkey, cat, goat, mouse and the hamster DNA was distinguished. So, in the gene, gene expression studies also the PCR can be used to uh, monitor the expression of that particular gene. 
So in a in a simple process the PCR can be used for cloning reactions. So what you are going to do is you are just going to take the genome sequence based on the genome sequence suppose you are interested to isolate the gene X what you are going to use is you are going to generate a forward primer which is for the gene X and then you are actually going to have the reverse primer which is for the gene X and then you are going to isolate the genome and from the genome you are going to set up a PCR with the help of the forward as well as the reverse primer and ultimately what you are going to get you are going to get the gene X fragment and this gene X fragment is going to have the restriction sites on the both sides which means this gene, fra gene fragment of the gene X is going to have the restriction sites on both the ends and these restriction sites can be used to integrate these gene X into a vector of your choice. So, you can uh, digest the vector with the help of these uh, set same set of en enzyme like for example R1 and R2 and you can be able to use that to integrate that into the your plasmids and then you can use this plasmids for downstream applications like you can use it for expression analysis or you can use it for the some other questions like whether you are interested to uh, monitor the replications and the transcriptions and translations and so, so you can do some basic research as well and you can do some application oriented work as well. So, uh, so this is all about the application of the PCR in different fields of the science. So, we started with the plant science and then we end up with the forensic science as well as the research applications. So, with this I would like to conclude my lecture here, thank you.